Today we're going to talk about angelic ministry. And the reason for that is, one, that Jesus uh, ministered a lot with angelic ministry. There's no way show up that clearly in scripture, but it was there. Last week we talked about heavenly places. Heavenly places is full of angelic uh, activity. And uh, we need to look at that because in Hebrews chapter 12 it says, We come to Mount Zion in these last days and also to an innumerable company of angels. Lots of angels. And we, we need to um, appreciate the ministry of angels because if you understand and you appreciate and you believe, then it happens. Okay? You have to believe to see. And um, God has got to be able to trust us with angels. If we become enamored by them, and they'll fade off the scene. They're not to be worshipped. They're not to take the place of the Lord Jesus Christ. Nevertheless, they're sent to us to assist us at all kinds of levels of life and ministry. Much of the Bible documents um, um, interaction with God's angels, interacting with God's people. There are at least 104 references in the Bible to angels um, appearing, visiting with people. That's an awful lot. And we say, well, you know, they're just for special occasions. Well, there is 104 just in the Word of God. Way back as far as Hagar and Abraham and Joshua and Moses and Elijah, Cornelius and John and Paul and so it goes Philip and so it goes on through, through the Bible. When we're talking about angels, we're talking about um, created beings who they obey and they they serve God. We're talking about God's angels. There are fallen angels. Fallen angels were deceived by Lucifer in a rebellion against God. And the Bible says they were cast out of heaven. Okay, not into the earth, but somewhere in between. And um, it says, you know, fallen angels, angels. Now we need to understand that angels, fallen angels, are definitely not demons. There's no relationship between the two. And we need to understand that regardless of what you've heard, demons are not fallen angels. Fallen angels are not demons. They get very uptight if you refer to them as demons. Those fallen angels, because it's just not their, you know, it's not their thing. Fallen angels um, have a body. They rule over the demonic world. And the Bible tells us in Revelation 12, 4, that at least a third of them fell with Lucifer. Now, demonic spirits... Um, are different, they're a different order, demons are earthbound, they are disembodied spirits, which means at one time they did have a body, but they're disembodied spirits, and because of that they seek to get into a living body to express themselves through. And of course the human race is the highest order of expression, if that is, uh, if they can't handle that, they'll go down to a lower race, such as the animal race. Um, but, um, and we're familiar with that when they, they, you know, Jesus cast out those demons and went in the herd of swine. Um, but we need to make that distinction. Demons are, um, you know, we're not going to get into where they came from. We'll get into that in the school. But they are a different order of being altogether. They are earthbound. They cannot get off the earth. And, and uh, they, they, demons form from very little harmless things, but this big to very large demons but they're not fallen angels. Fallen angels do not inhabit the earth. They come down at times, but they live in the heavenlies, further, uh, further out. And one day the Bible tells us that they're going to be cast out of heaven onto the earth because they're not here. They don't live on the earth. They visit the earth, fallen angels. But the Bible says they're going to be cast out of heaven into the earth. And woe, it says, for the inhabitants of the earth um, in that day. Okay? And... Uh, it says in Revelation 12, 4, And his tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and angels of heaven, and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered. One day they're going to be cast from that realm into, this, into the earth. Okay, but as we move to the end of the age, an awareness of angels is going to definitely increase. We are going to see a tremendous lot of activity in the angelic realm. And we need to understand a little about it. Hebrews 12, 22, We're coming to an innumerable... Um, company of angels. We won't turn to it today because of the sake of time, but in Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28 describe the fall of Lucifer and the reasons why he fell and was cast out of heaven. 
But we're not dealing with fallen angels today. We're dealing with, with God's angels. God's angels are very intelligent. They, they have emotion. They are immortal. That means they don't die. Uh, they're not to be worshipped. They can travel exceedingly fast. It always seems that they can travel at the speed of um, thought. You know? Uh, they can be visible or invisible. They can even cook. You know, they cooked a meal for Elijah. They are organized into ranks. In the um, fallen angel realm, the fallen angel realm, there are four orders in the fallen, fallen angel realm. Principalities, powers. Remember, it tells us in Ephesians 6.12, there are four levels there. The spirits in high places. But also in God's realm, it would appear that there are four major um, orders of angels. And we look at that briefly today. There is the cherubims. Seraphims, Archangels, and Gabriel's, and uh, Gabriel's order. We look at first of all today, um, Archangels. There's not a lot, a lot said in scripture about Archangels. Um, it would appear that um, Lucifer was an Archangel before he fell. We know that Michael is an Archangel. It says in Jude 1 9, yet Michael the Archangel. And Kay talks about him as being an Archangel. And then in in, in Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1 it says, At that time shall Michael stand up, that great prince, which stands for the children of your people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to the same time. Okay? And it's talking about, the, again, Michael as an, an archangel. If we read in, in, let me just read the scripture to you from Daniel. If you have your Bibles, you can come across into Daniel. and Just very, very quickly look at that. Um, angels are very interesting creatures in Daniel 12 it talks about that at that time verse 1 shall Michael stand up that great prince which standeth for the children of their people there shall be a time um, of, of real uh, trouble and verse 3, And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and till me, turn many unto righteousness as the stars forever. But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, for the time that time is the time of the end. And many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be, be increased. But we're certainly living in, in that day um, today. Okay? And so, this angel appears unto Daniel. And it's starting to give him revelation about the end time. How many about us that we know a little about the end times? And um, I, I, I have a friend who had a visitation from the Lord one day, um, a friend in America, and uh, the Lord began to talk to him about the, the end times. And he said, the church has got some of it right, but most of it wrong. <laughs> yes. <Yeah>. Well, <laughs> you know, there's a lot we need to know. The books have yet to be opened. And we're going to have angelic visitation, particularly the prophet who's going to bring revelation on the end times um, like never before. But here, here we have this angel visiting um, uh, at Daniel. And uh, we see him there speaking to him, archangels. Now, archangels appear in the word of God to be in charge of warfare. They're in charge of warfare. They head up warfare. That doesn't mean to say that every time we have some warfare, Michael turns up. But at least somebody under him is going to turn up, okay? And um, it's, uh, he's much involved in world events and, and nation-changing situations, spiritual warfare. And, you know, often angels work ahead of us by uh, sovereignly, by preventing things from happening. And quite often that will happen. We don't even know. It's, it's, if I was to ask you today... How many of you have been conscious of angelic visitation? How many of you, put your hands up, have been conscious of angelic visitation? Okay. All of you would have had angelic visitation. But being conscious of it is another thing. You see, angelic angels are very kind of, um, they visit us more than we realize. And quite often it's sovereign. But sometimes you see in spiritual warfare, when, when God is the Lord is calling us together from spiritual warfare, it it would seem that when we get into warfare, they cooperate with us. Often I have seen whole realms of angels waiting for, in a, for us in a warfare meeting to give a particular command before they would move. 
And there seems to be a sinking of those angels in the realm of the spirit and the realm of warfare. And so there is a whole whole um, bunch of angels who, you know, who really are involved in spiritual warfare. That's their thing. And the thing is, they love it. They really love it. They love getting into a fight. They love getting into battle. They cannot wait. Um, it, it, there's an awful lot in scripture on that. You know, whenever you see that phrase, that phrase the, the, the Lord of hosts, it comes up about 273 times in the Bible. That's an awful lot for anything to be repeated. The Lord of hosts. And it, it's, that word host is, is a Hebrew word. It, it, it means a, a massing of angels, especially in warfare. And as you go through the Bible, you, you notice every time that, that word is used, um, the Lord of hosts. You know, when, 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 when um, David came against Goliath, what did he say? He said, you come against me with a sword and a spear, so, so, but I come against you in the name of the Lord, not just the Lord, but the Lord of hosts. And he used that word. You see, there were, the, if, if, if we've been living in that time and our eyes have been opened, you would have seen the heavenly host with David. You see, who guided that stone right into the forehead of Goliath? See, there, there was angelic intervention. He was calling upon the name, not just the name of the Lord, but the name of the Lord of hosts. That's in First Samuel 17. And, um, it, it, and, and maybe I should read a, a few scriptures to you from Samuel about David, because we see it in his life an awful lot, you know. Um, in first, uh, Second Samuel chapter 5 and verse 10. Reads like this about the Lord of hosts, not just the Lord, but the Lord of hosts. Second Samuel five and verse ten. It says it reads like this. And David went on and grew great, and the Lord God of hosts was with him. The Lord God with and all the angelic hosts were with him. Who was with David in battle all of those times? See, who strengthened those people with the spirit of might? The spirit of might is an angelic presence, you see. And some of those mighty men of David did in, in superhuman things. They fought all day, you know, and, and, and they did superhuman things, David's mighty men. But see, the Lord of hosts was with them. The spirit of might was with them. And, um, you know, it, 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 we can go on right through the word of God in, in First Chronicles 11. Um, and verse 8, it, it, it mentions it again about the Lord of hosts, the Lord of angels. 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 9. So David waxed greater and greater, for the Lord of hosts was with him. And he's talking about that angelic um, invention, especially in the realm of warfare, the Lord of hosts. And so, in, in, in the Bible, 273 times it comes up, the Lord of hosts. We need to continually call upon the Lord of hosts to be with us. And, uh, and so we have that, that archangels which are in the realm of spiritual warfare, warfare in the earth. And uh, during the various Israeli wars, there's been clear documented evidence by hard, you know, some of these uh, Israeli soldiers were actually atheists. But suddenly when the battle was going hard for them, Angels would turn up and they documented, these guys, you know, some of them were, some couple of them were generals. They documented that, that angels, and the, the particular one time when they were about to be overrun by the Egyptians, suddenly a whole host of angels turned up behind them. And the whole Egyptians turned and ran. And they thought, you know, we've got reinforcements. But it was a band of angels that had come. They, and document after document, it's been documented through the various Israeli wars, angelic intervention. They love it. They love getting into it. And so it, it is part of that realm, the archangels. There is another realm of angels, and that is Gabriel. Gabriel, or Gabriel's band. Now, Gabriel is the messenger of the Lord. He turns up in Scripture at least four times, and he, he is always the bearer of good news or revelation. So if, if Gabriel turns up, or one of his bands, somebody who is under him turns up, there's going to be revelation of good news. And the, the Bible is full of scripture where angels bring people good news. Or they bring them revelation. He is always the bearer of good news. The one that came to Daniel in Daniel chapter 8 
Verse 16, he said, I heard a man's voice between the banks of the Uli River, which is called, and said, Gabriel, make this man to understand the vision. Okay, he had an angelic visitation, bringing him revelation of the end time. And it was Gabriel that turned up. And, um, and it says, Behold, I will make you to know what shall be in the last days. Daniel 8 and verse 19. In Luke chapter 1, Verse 11, it says, There appeared unto him an angel of the Lord, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for your prayer is heard. And thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. And Zacharias said to the angel in verse 18, Whereby shall I know this? How do I know this is true? For I'm old, I'm an old man, and my wife is well stricken in years. And the angel answered and said unto him, I am Gabriel. And that stand in the presence of God and I'm sent to speak to you and to show you these um, glad tidings. Remember the angel that came to Mary? Told her that she was going to bear a child. Who was that? Gabriel. Always the, in fact, you know, you got to be careful. For, uh, two out of the four times he turned up and spoke to a woman, both of them got pregnant. <laughs> so yeah, it's very interesting. The bearer of good news. Uh, <laughs> Maybe it's not. Okay. There's a vast band of angels under Gabriel that bring revelation, guidance, dreams, visions. I've had an angel come up behind me, put his hand on my shoulder, and instantly I'm in vision. Almost out of my body in vision, but in vision. Very, very strong vision. It's angelic, generated. The Bible says about Pilate's wife, remember, the angel visited her in the night and she dreamed. It says a dream. An angel just came alongside Pilate's wife, who was not in the kingdom of God, but um, was, you know, came alongside him. This angel came alongside her as she slept, possibly just touched her, and she began to dream. And she said to Pilate the next day, be very, very careful what you do here. So I had a vision, a visitation, and then I, I had a dream and, uh, and about this man called Jesus. And so, you know, the, the scriptures, you know, uh, are full of angels coming giving messages, speaking the word of the Lord. Acts chapter 8, 26 says, The angel of the Lord spoke unto Philip, saying, Arise, and go towards the south. Spoke to him, told him what to do. Okay? He was in the desert. In Paul's life, it says in Acts 27, 23, There they stood by me this night, the angel of God, whom I am and whom I serve, saying, he gives them the message, You must be brought before Caesar, and lo, God hath given all, the, all them that say with you. Remember, they were on the boat? And they were in a dangerous situation, angel turns up. You say, well, why didn't the Holy Spirit just speak to him? Because God loves to use his creation. Why does God send you to speak to someone? Why does God send the Holy Spirit to speak to you? Because he loves, you see, there's, there's a whole, God loves getting people in his kingdom involved. And he loves sending angels with words of the Lord. And it is the word of the Lord. Whether it comes to an angel, the Holy Spirit, or whatever, it's still God speaking to us. We need to understand that. We're going to see more and more of this begin to happen. And he said, fear not. He says, you, you will all be saved. You know, last year I was out praying uh, and um, an angel appeared to me and said, you're to go to Pakistan. I went, oh, yeah. Um, it was very clear, very clear angel, very clear. And he, he stood right next to me, confronted me on this. And, uh, and he said, this is what you are to do. And he quoted the scripture to me. Um, and he quoted Acts 26 and verse 18, which was to, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan unto God, that they might receive forgiveness of sins and then an inheritance in the kingdom of God. And um, it was very, very interesting because the, 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 there were, when I finally, finally did make it to Pakistan, over a thousand Muslims came to the Lord. Incredible. Uh, I mean, Pakistan is a fanatical country. If you witness to someone on the street, by law, they can shoot you. They don't, there's no trial, they can shoot you by law. And they all carry guns. I mean, it's a fanatical nation. And, uh, you know, in the last meeting I had in Lahore, we had over 20,000 in the meeting. And, uh, you know, God was moving. And, and this scripture came to pass to open their eyes, to turn them, turn them from darkness to light from the power of Satan to God, that they might receive the forgiveness of sins. And then from darkness to light. It's very interesting because 
we lost count of how many totally blind people were healed in those, in those meetings, in those crusades. I mean, it was a very, very interesting time. But you know, it was through angelic. I would never have gone to Pakistan. Believe you me, I would not have gone to Pakistan. Um, you know, I'm not that brave. And uh, But I was praying, you see, and suddenly, angelic visitation. It's this easy to do. And I, I didn't know anyone in Pakistan, not a living soul. Didn't know anyone. And um, very, very interesting, about two weeks after that, that visitation, I got an invitation from a tiny little post-square church to go to Pakistan. And the meeting started with about 150 people and ended with over 20,000 in the meeting. I mean, and God does something, he does it. Very interesting. But you see, it was very clear through angelic visitation. And I thought, well, you know, he said to me, you're to go. And sometime later, I was praying about the money to go because it's expensive and I just didn't have that kind of money. And I was praying about the money to go. And suddenly the same angel turns up. And he said, I want you to stop praying. Okay. <laughs> stop praying. He said, your tickets are already there. I hadn't told anyone about this, you know. And, 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 and um, that, that was, I came to, two or three days later, I came to church. It was a Sunday. And a man, in the con- a man in this congregation walked up to me and said, I feel you should go. Lord wants you to go overseas, da, 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 da. And then the funds began to come. So it's interesting about this whole kind of situation. And uh, it's, you know, it's interesting. That thing, in the last meeting in Lahore, which is way up on, on the frontier with Afghanistan, a wild place, oh, it gets, gets wild up there. I mean, it was a wild place. We had 20,000 in a football field preaching the gospel. And um, it's that, and right towards the end of the service, that angel turned up again, stood right next to me on the platform, and only behind me there was about five ministers on the platform, and only one of them saw it. And that angel turned up and said to me, I want you to speak a word over the nation. Uh-oh, oh yes, okay. Then, uh, so I waited, there's no word came. No word came, I waited. So I preached a bit more and I waited. And he said, I want you to speak a word over the nation. So I said, what is it? He said, you speak, and I will give you it. <laughs> I thought, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So you've got to cooperate. Obedience and faith is all part of that. And, uh, and so I said, there, and I said, the Lord has a word for this nation. Nothing. <laughs> I said, the Lord would say unto this nation, and right then he put his hand on my shoulder. Then for about 20 minutes I prophesied across that nation. Interesting kind of... See, this is all working with angels, angelic visitation, working with the angelic realm. And, um, you know, it was very, very interesting because um, we closed that meeting and the mili- and I got on a plane and f- flew out there as quickly as I could. We went straight from that football field to the, the airport, got on a plane, and the military turned up one hour later. But the meeting had closed. And I was then in Karachi, and the next day I flew out to Perth. But um, interesting time. The angel said unto Philip, you see, arise and go towards the south, and I'll tell you what to do. You know, and uh, it, it, it's, it's very, very interesting. Some years ago, I think I shared with you before, I was chairing a very difficult church business meeting, and um, the outcome was going to affect the destiny of the church. It was a very difficult meeting. And um, I had rewritten the Constitution to accommodate what I felt that God wanted, that, which the direction God wanted that church to go in, but there was some opposition, quite some strong opposition against it. Anyway, we had this meeting, and, and, and as I was just about to, to speak at that meeting, I felt, and I was just sitting in the front, I felt a hand come on my shoulder. When I looked at the hand, it was transparent, and I thought, well, I'm not going to turn around. <laughs> I knew it was an angel, and he just clearly said to me, just relax. It will all go through. There will be no opposition. That was a miracle. A real miracle because only a third of the church didn't want this. But I knew it was God. And so I quite, you know, I was quite relaxed from that point on. It went through quite easily. See? They have tremendous power. They can persuade people. We must miss, we mustn't, you know, misunderstand the, the, the power of angels to bring people into the kingdom of God. When you pray for somebody's salvation, angels are released to influence them every time. And you need to be aware of that. Angels are released. 
The Bible's got a lot about angels and the, and the gospel in the word of God. Every time you pray for somebody's salvation, angels are released. And they'll keep at that person and keep at that person to bring them to a point of decision. Very, very interesting um, to kind of, you know, watch that and watch it happen. Angelic voices is not... You know, we talked about that spontaneous thought. That's not how angelic voices sound. That's how the internal voice of the Holy Spirit sounds within. It sounds like your thought, but it's spontaneous. The voice of angels is not like that. The voice of angels seems external, has its own diction, has its own voice. It is an external thing. I, I have never, and I'm not saying it doesn't always it kind of come that way, but I have not experienced an angelic communication internally, ever. It has always been external, and it has not felt the same as my thought. Whereas the Holy Spirit speaks within us in a spontaneous flow of thought. Angels, I've never experienced that with angels. It is an external voice. And um, that's why you need to challenge any spiritual experience, particularly if it's external. You need to challenge it. And, um, you know, it must be challenged. You know, when the, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joshua... And people say, well, that was a theophany, you know, it was, it, it, it was the Lord. I don't think it was, but, you know, the angel of the Lord, he said, I am captain of the hosts of the Lord. Okay, he was a captain. And, um, but Joshua drew his sword, and he said, are you for us or against us? There was a challenge made right at that point. And um, it, it, it's interesting because First John 4, 2 says, Hey, by you know the Spirit of God that... Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. He said, you know, and every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ has not come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of Antichrist. Whereof you have heard that it should come, and even now works in the world. And 2 John chapter 1 verse 7 says, For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. This is the deceiver and is an Antichrist. Now, you have someone who is, you know, maybe has someone who has demonic problems and you can say to them, has Jesus Christ come in the flesh? And they'll turn around and say yes. Unless the demon is actually manifesting them and speaking through them. You know what I'm saying? If you're going to challenge a spirit, it's got to be manifesting and speaking. Otherwise the person will speak. And the person believes in Jesus, but the demon doesn't. So you understand. But when we're dealing with angels, they have to be challenged. Because the Bible says they can come as an angel of light. Uh, believe you me, you cannot tell the difference when that happens. Um, it, it's, um, you know, I had an experience some, some years ago where I was thinking of resigning a church I was pastoring. And I kind of thought, yeah, maybe it's time for me to resign. Maybe it's time for me to move on. And then I was thinking about this. I've been praying about it for, for a few weeks and just bringing it before the Lord. And one day I was sitting in my office and I was praying about this. And an angel turned up about four feet away from me, the other side of my desk. A beautiful angel, a real beautiful angel, lots of light, and a beautiful angel. And uh, I, I just pulled a piece of paper out, and I was, I was drafting my resignation. And um, this, this angel was kind of urging me to do this. And I thought, hmm, yeah. And then I had a, an unusual funny feeling that I'm not quite sure about this. And I looked at this angel and I put the pen down and I said to this angel, has Jesus Christ come in the flesh? Well, the transformation was unbelievable. <laughs> I mean, he turned into the darkest angel I had ever seen and came at me over my desk and I made a fatal mistake. I tried to handle him in the natural. I mean, you know, you can't do that because your, <laughs> your hands go through them. <laughs> But he can handle you and you can't handle him. A real bad disadvantage, I tell you. And it's only when I realized what I was doing, I began to call upon the name of the Lord and rebuke it, that I broke through that situation. You see, it wasn't from God. You've got to challenge these spirits. Otherwise, deception can come in real quick. Any external experience has to be challenged like that. If it's of God or not. Experiences with angels, you know. It's kind of interesting the Bible tells us, you know, that, um, you know, I had another experience and I was, I was preaching in, my, in the church and it was a large church and I was pre preparing before the service 
behind the stage in a little room and I was just preparing. Nobody can get backstage, you know, and uh, we had um, uh, we had a policeman on either side of the front of the auditorium who kind of monitored things. They came to our church and they, and I was, could get behind stage and I was fairly good quiet. But this day, this man walked into the room and he just looked like an ordinary man, although his skin was very, very refined and he, was, he wasn't white, he was kind of just slightly colored, kind of bronzy, and he walked in, and he looked just like an ordinary person. I thought, how did you get in here? You know, uh, uh, and I was just preparing and praying before the meeting. I like to be left alone and I'd pray with the musicians, we'd go on. And so I was just there alone and this, this person walked into my room and um, he spoke to me. And I looked at this person and um, there is a feeling, you know, there's an inner witness that this is not natural. I looked at this guy again and I said to him, what do you want? And he said, I have a message for you for this nation. Here to speak it tonight. And so I said, you know, are you for me or against me? No change. I said, has Jesus Christ come in the flesh? This man looked at me and said, yes, and he has come in your flesh. I knew this was the Lord. I knew this, 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 this person was from God. And he looked just like a human being. Okay? He gave me this message. He gave me this message about New Zealand, about the hand of the Lord lifting off New Zealand. And um, it's, it's very, very interesting. He turned around and walked out, but this time he didn't come in through the door. He walked through it. And before he left, he said a strange thing to me. He said, just before he left, he said, I need to go now. I need to be in India tonight. And I thought, you're not going to make it, mate. <laughs> you know. <laughs> you know. And, um, you know, it's very, very, it's very, very interesting that, you know, it says, well, it is, it's just a very, very interesting scene. Now, Hebrews 13, 2 says, be not forgetful to entertain strangers, because thereby some of the entertained angels unawares. This person looked just like an ordinary person. And, um, Hebrews 13, 2, don't, you know, be careful, entertain strangers, for thereby some of the entertained angels unawares. And, uh, we have that kind of a, a situation. The messengers of God can come to us and give us messages. They have to be challenged. You never worship them. You never get enamored by them. The Lord is always thankful, but he sends them. And we need to be aware of that very quickly because time is running by. Um, seraphims. Seraphims are interesting creatures. It's another order of angels. These have quite a number of wings. They're very unusual creatures. Literally, the seraphim means a spirit of burning. The literal Hebrew for seraphim is a spirit of burning. In Isaiah 6.2 it says, And above it stood the seraphim. Remember in the year that Isaiah died, Isaiah was caught up to the throne of God? Remember that story in Isaiah 6? Verse 2 it says, And above the throne stood the seraphim. Each had six wings, and with two they covered their face, and with two they covered their feet, and with two they did fly. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. See, their main message, their main outflow, their character and nature was holiness. And so that is the nature of seraphims. Um, Isaiah 6 and verse 6 says, Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken from off the altar, the altar, and touched his mouth. And said, Lo, as it touched his lips, said, Your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is purged. It's a very interesting angelic operation there. The angels come in, takes a coat off the altar, touches the lips of this prophet. And something changes in the man. And um, these, um, these angels have to do with the fire of God. They have to do with holiness through fire. They have to do with the baptism of fire. We read in, in Isaiah 4, 4, it says, When the Lord shall have washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion, and shall have purged the blood of Jerusalem from the midst thereof, with what? By the spirit of judgment or the spirit of burning, the spirit of seraphims, there's a literal rendition of that. Purging away the sin. I just want to read something to you. It's an interesting, um, it's from a, a, an orphanage in India where they had a visitation of the Lord and seraphims and the spirit of the fear of the Lord. And it was in a little Indian orphanage where the missionaries had been praying for God to visit these kids. They prayed for a long time, two, three years, for God to visit these kids. And suddenly, it says, 
in the work in India, we, re, we read that the, suddenly the girls in India were so wonderfully wrought upon and baptized with the spirit and fire in the, the Rambai's mission. Um, it began, it, as they began to come under conviction of sin, great light was given to them. When delivered, they jumped up and down for hours without fatigue. In fact, were stronger for it. They cried out with the burning that came upon them. Some fell as they saw a great light and fire pass before them. While the fire of God burned the members of the body of sin and pride and anger and love of the world and selfishness and uncleanness, they neither ate nor slept until the fire had done its job. Then the joy was so great that for two or three days after receiving this baptism of the Holy Spirit and fire, they didn't even eat or care for food. About 20 girls went into a trance at one time and became unconscious of this world for hours, some for three or four days. During that time they sang, prayed, clapped their hands, rolled about, sat still. When they became uh, conscious, they told of seeing the throne of heaven, a white robe throng and a, and a glory so bright they could not bear it. Soon the whole place was aflame. The school had to be suspended. They forgot to eat or sleep. And whole night for whole nights and days they were absorbed in prayer. And uh, the spirit was poured out upon one of the seeking girls in the night. Her companion sleeping next to her awoke and seeing her on fire ran and crossed, got a bucket of water and threw it over her. That's how real it was, you see. In less than an hour, nearly all the girls in the compound were weeping, praying, confessing their sins. Many of these girls were invested with a strange but beautiful and supernatural fire. The spontaneous composition of spiritual songs was a feature of these meetings and in other parts of India. At Kara Camp, pictures appeared on the wall to the company of, of the, the small girls and the congregation in prayer, supernaturally depicting the life of Christ. The figures moved in the picture and were in colors. Each view would last from two to ten minutes and then the light would gradually fade and a new picture reappear for a few moments more with a new scene. These appeared for twelve hours and were not only seen by the native children of the orphanage and the eight missionaries, but by native Christians living nearby. Even the unsaved came to see this, these wonderful sight. These pictures were all depicting faithfully the Bible narration of the gospel and were entirely supernatural. And they had a tremendous effect on breaking up the hardness of hearts in the unsaved. I bet they did. <laughs> He goes on to say that in Wales, colored lights were often seen, balls of fire during the revival there. That was a baptism of fire. How many of you know we need a baptism of fire today? We need it to clean up the church. We, we, we need God to come in like he's never come in. You see, these, these, the, the ministry of these, these spirits, um, these cherubims, have to do with the baptism of fire. And wherever they came, their message was holiness and fire. Spirits of burning. And that, that was their main uh, outflow. We need that. How many of you know the next thing on the list is the baptism of fire? I want to tell you, the Toronto blessing is great and it's fine. People mustn't make it an end in, themselves, in itself. Otherwise, it, it, it will be kind of productive. But I want to tell you, the next thing on the list of God is the baptism of fire. And that's what he's really after. And when that comes, I want to tell you, it's going to revolutionize the face of the church. God purges the church by two things, judgment and fire. That's all he said he'd do, judgment and fire. I'd rather have the fire than the judgment any day. <laughs> anyway, he's going to do this in these last days very quickly, cherubim. How many of you know the kind of artist picture cherubims of these kind of fat little babies with a bow and arrow? <laughs> Isn't like that at all, believe you me. They don't look like that, I tell you now. <laughs> they have to do with the glory of God. And these are another interesting creatures. They have to do with, the, with God's glory. And uh, I'll read you a few scriptures on this because it is important and it is interesting. And um, the glory of God. When these turn up, the glory of God is manifest. See, we need to know how to pray and what to pray for if we want the glory of God. These characters, these cherubims, they are awesome creatures. And they have to do with the glory of the Lord. And it, it, it reads in Ezekiel chapter 10, in verse 4 it says, you know, it's very interesting, this picture in Ezekiel, God's spirit was lifting off a nation. And it's depicted as the glory of God slowly lifting off the temple, then off the city, 
and it's sitting on the mountain and it's gone. And God's gone. The glory of God is gone. I mean, it's Ichabod. The glory is departed. Finished. And this is depicting it. And, 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 and Ezekiel has seen this in the spirit. And Ezekiel 10 verse 4 says, And then the glory of the Lord went up from the cherubim. And they stood over the threshold of the house. That's the temple. And the house was filled with the cloud. And the court was full of the brightness of the Lord's glory. And the sound of these cherubim's wings was heard even to the outer court as the voice of the Almighty God when he speaks. And so we have this picture over the temple. They, they began to come out into the outer court of the temple. God's presence is lifting. Reluctant to go, but, lift, but it's, very, it's happening. And in verse um, 14, uh, it says, and every one of them had four faces. Oh, we won't go into that face of the church. Verse 18, and the glory of the Lord departed from off the threshold of the house, that's off of the temple, and stood again over the cherubims. And the cherubims lifted up their wings and flew from the earth in my sight and went out. The, the wheels also were beside them, and everyone stood at the door of the east gate of the Lord's house, and the glory of God of Israel was over from above. Okay? Now it's beginning to lift, lift, lift. This is the living creature that I saw under the God of Israel by the river of Sheba. Everyone had four faces and so on. And the likeness of their faces were the same faces which I saw. And everyone went straight forward. These, these are these creatures. Now, lifting off the temple, lifting off the city. The glory of God is going. And then finally, we read in, in um, chapter 11 and um, in verse 22... It says, then did the cherubims lift up their wings and the wheels beside them and the glory of God of Israel was over them above and the glory of the Lord went up from the midst of the city and stood upon the mountain which is on the east side of the city. Why is the glory lifting? In the next, in chapter 12 verse 2 it says, there were rebellious people, a rebellious house. Now, it's interesting because as soon as the cherubims left, the glory of God left with them. These creatures bring the manifestation of the glory of God. And we see it through the scripture. When it, later we see as the glory of God came back into Israel, it came the same way with the cherubims coming back. They have to do with the glory of God. And, um, you know, in the tabernacle, remember the tabernacle, Moses' tabernacle in the holiest of all where the glory, the Shekinah glory was, there was the mercy seat. And what was over the mercy seat? Two cherubims. The symbolic of the manifestation of the presence of God. Glory of God. First Samuel 4, 4. So the great, so the people sent to Shiloh that they might bring from thence the ark of the covenant of the Lord of hosts who dwells between the cherubim. Okay, now what happens if you read, if you read a bit further, you know, it says that the, the priest fell and broke his neck. And what did the Bible say? The glory of God is departed. He wrote the name above Ichabod. The cherubims had gone. The glory of God had departed. And, uh, and so we see that these, these, these are interesting characters, these cherubims. We're going to do a study on the glory of God because I believe God wants to manifest his glory in, pe in the church and on his people like never before. I mean, visibly manifest his glory. And it's to do with these creatures, the manifestation of these creatures. You get in the presence of these creatures for just a few minutes and you'll carry it for days. The, the impartation from these creatures is so great. And... Uh, God wants us to understand this and, and, and be aware and be able to cooperate when these things begin to happen. To do that, you've got to see in the Spirit. To begin to co cooperate with these. Okay, angels, you know, there are all kinds of angels. Um, they, there are angels that worship angels. You have a guardian angel. The Bible talks about children having guardian angels. How many of you know that there's no record of them disappearing as you grow older? Okay. Always beholding their, their, the face of their father in heaven. <coughs> or, or, or the father, not their father, the father. Always beholding the face of God. And at a moment, at, at the speed of thought, they can be at your side. Just takes God. They go. Angels. Angels. Angels all around us. I have some friends who were, were missionaries in the Himalayas. And um, they had friends in New Zealand. And they got stuck up in the Himalayas in a four-wheel drive. And uh, it was snowing badly, and they were very, very badly snowed in. And they were one in, in one of the remotest areas of the Himalayas, where nobody lived. They couldn't find the roads anymore because the snow was deep. 
and virtually nobody traveled those roads but God had told them to come over the Himalayas into India and preach at a conference and so they actually were crossing in a, in, in a jeep and uh, they, they, got, they got stuck in the snow and uh, they just, just couldn't go any further, no way back, no way further and um, it was kind of, um, they said well they had maybe two hours before they would die because the cold was that intense and um, so they just prayed and said, God, you told us to come, and if our mission is, is not finished on this earth, you've got to send us help, send us angels to help us out of this. And they prayed for about 15, 20 minutes, and they looked up, and as they turned around, they saw, would you believe, a grader on the top of the Himalayas coming down the road. <laughs> and they said, can't be. You don't have graders in the Himalayas, never mind. It's Plowing down the road. This is a true story. It's a true story. I know the people firsthand. They're good people. True story. Coming down, cleared the road for them. And they followed this grader for about two hours. Cleared the road, got them off the heavy areas, got them into a low, lower country. And then pulled, the grader pulled over. And they, 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 they thought, so, well, we'll get out and thank this guy. They got out to thank this guy, went up to the grader, and the grader and man just disappeared. It's gone. See, that's angelic. You see? They love doing things like that. They, they, they say, well, why didn't he just sweep his hand? Well, he probably liked driving graders. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> How many of you know there are normal, natural things in heaven, like streets and roads, and, and on the lakes there are boats, and, and there are all kinds of things. You know, you just throw everything away. You know, it, it's there. These were good people, good missionaries. Can appear as, people can appear as men. Angels can be assigned to us. Different times in our life. When I was in India, Brother Dinakaram began to prophesy over me that an, that an angel would go with me from India. And he described this angel to me and said he would go with you from India, blah, blah, blah. Very interesting because every now and again this angel turns up. He's been with me ever since that assignment. He said, assigned. He said, Hallelujah. We'll close out by talking very quickly about the seven spirits of the Lord. Um, very quickly. In Isaiah chapter 11, you're familiar with Isaiah 11, where it talks about the spirits of the Lord, the anointing upon Jesus. Isaiah chapter 11 and verse 1, it says, And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. His prophetic talking about Jesus. And it says this, and the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom, the Spirit of understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge, and the fear of the Lord. These anointings, these seven spirits that were upon Jesus, um, says, and it shall make him quick of understanding in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither shall he reprove after the hearing of his ears. As you see, with true, true judgment, true discernment, and it's talking about an anointing, because Jesus said later in, in the Gospel, he said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon him, quoting this. Now this is very, very interesting. These are the seven spirits of the Lord. There are seven spirits. Seven angelic spirits, which are carriers of seven specific anointings. And um, we need to understand this in, in, in the book of Zechariah, chapter 4, verse 6, it reads like this. Let me just read it to you. Talking about the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Then, uh, 4, verse 6. Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord, and it is verbal, saying, It's not by might, and it's not by power, but it's by my Spirit. The anointing of God, the Spirit of God. Then he goes on to talk about this. And... Uh, about this, this, this spirit of the Lord. Verse 9. And it says, The hand of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. His hand shall also finish it. And I shall know that the Lord of hosts hath sent me unto you. For who has despised the day of small things? For they shall rejoice when they see the measuring line in the hand of Zerubbabel. With those seven. Seven what? What was with him? Those seven. It says, they are the eyes of the Lord, which run to and fro throughout the whole earth. Talked about the anointing, it's not by my, not by power, but by my spirit, said the Lord. He said, I'm going to do this by the anointing. He said, I'm going to be with you. Don't despise the day of small things. He said, I'm going to be with you with these seven. Seven what? Seven eyes of the Lord. You know, Second Chronicles 16, 19, the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth. You know, and he's talking about the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Okay, that's in, <coughs> in Zechariah. Uh, in, in chapter, chapter 4 
the case the anointing, the seven eyes. Now he's coming chapter three, coming to chapter three. He's talking about one of the others, one of the high priests that were helping him by the name of Joshua. Not Joshua out of the days of Moses, but a high priest. And uh, it's talking about how the Lord will be with him. It says in verse 8 of chapter 3, Hear now, Joshua, the high priest, thou that thy fellows that sit before thee, for they are men to be wondered at. For behold, I will bring forth my servant the branch. For behold, the stone that I have laid before Joshua, even upon one stone, shall be seven arms. He talks about seven eyes, talking about seven spirits of the Lord. He's talking about the eyes of the Lord running to him, seven eyes of the Lord running to throughout the whole earth. And, um, and so we, we have this kind of picture in the book of Zechariah. Very quickly come across the Revelation. Revelation chapter 1, the book of Revelation, and we'll draw to a close. Revelation chapter 1. I haven't spoken on this for a long time. And, I really feel we need to kind of understand some of these, some of these things. Revelation chapter 1 and um, verses 4. Verse 4, chapter 1. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him that is and which was and which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne. Okay. Okay, and from Jesus Christ. Now, talking about Jesus is from the seven spirits and from Jesus, who is the faithful witness. Okay, so we have reference of seven spirits before the throne of God. Then in verse 12, and uh, it says this, And I turned to see, and a voice that spoke with me, and I being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks, which represents the anointing. Seven, seven golden candlesticks, seven anointings. Okay, and then in verse... Um, um, chapter 4 and verse 5, chapter 4 of the book of Revelation and verse 5. Um, chapter 4 and verse 5, it says, And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunders and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Okay? There were seven lamps, <coughs> lights, a fire burning before the throne of God, which are the seven spirits of God. So here we pick up a picture. We come from Isaiah 11, we have the seven anointings upon Jesus. Zechariah says, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, seven eyes of the Lord. Same thing he's talking about. We come into the book of Revelation, we pick it up again. And um, then in chapter, capping this whole thing, it, it often is in chapter 4, and verse 3, it talks about a, a rainbow and he sat and looked, and, uh, and immediately I was in the spirit, verse 2, and behold, the throne was set in heaven, and one sat upon the throne, and he that sat upon was to look upon like jasper with a sardine stone, and there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight. So they have this light, a rainbow, seven colors, seven lamps, seven spirits of the Lord. And I began to realize many years ago that quite often I would be praying for someone or I would be in a, in a service and I would begin to sense a particular glory of the Lord in the presence, a glory of the glory of the Lord manifest in a meeting. And if I was kind of sensitive at that time, that glory of the Lord would take on a particular hue, a particular color. And I didn't understand this for a long time and, and, and only through understanding what was happening when I began to see that did I begin to understand you know, this, this whole area of um, the anointings. You know, now we're not talking about, how many of you know there isn't a cultish thing called color therapy? You know, we understand that. Um, we're not talking about that. I think we're a little mature to understand. We're not talking about color therapy. We're talking about the anointing. The anointing of God's Spirit. And I began to realize that when the prophetic anointing turned up, it was a particular color of that rainbow. It says that the, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. That was the prophetic anointing to declare the Word of God, he said. Prophetic anointing. The Spirit of God is upon it. And the first color in the rainbow there is red. And when you see that, that, that anointing, that, 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 that glory, that presence of God is a glory, and it, and it, it begins to be show never, never great, very rare, it's a great, bright red, but it's red. And you know that there is a prophetic anointing manifest in the presence of God. The next color down was the spirit of wisdom, which was orange. That's a very great anointing. 
The spirit of understanding, which is yellow. You need to write these down so you remember them. The spirit of the Lord is red. The spirit of wisdom is orange. The spirit of understanding is yellow. The spirit of counsel is green. The spirit of counsel operates. That is a true anointing of God to give godly counsel supernaturally by an anointing. The spirit of counsel. This often comes with a, 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 a green kind of hue of the anointing. The presence of the Lord. The spirit of might is blue. How many of you know that Samson had a spirit of might with him? <laughs> and many of David's mighty men had a spirit of might with them. Okay? That was angelic. It was one of the seven spirits of the Lord. Or one of the spirits under them, you know, under their band. And uh, it's uh, the spirit of might. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were cast into the burning, fiery furnace, clothed in the spirit of might, and nothing could touch them. Well, maybe we're going to need that in the end times. Hallelujah. <laughs> spirit of might. Spirit of knowledge is indigo, and the fear of the Lord is violet. When the spirit, that is an angel, a very powerful angel, the spirit of the Lord, there are many of them under this seven spirits in him. The spirit of the Lord, the spirit of the fear of the Lord, when he turns up, conviction comes. When he is there, or one of the angels under him, and they come in various levels of intensity. Have you noticed that sometimes conviction is really great and sometimes conviction is not so great? Depending on the, the authority of the angel that's present. See, the spirit of the fear of the Lord is angelic. And uh, seven, branch candles, seven branch candlestick, seven spirits, seven lamps, seven eyes of the Lord. The eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show themselves strong on behalf of those whose heart is perfect towards him. They want to work with us. Now, and what we've got to come to and is a real sense of humility. You see, why these things don't work with us? Because we think we have it. Or we think we can do it. And when we come to a place of absolute dependence and, and true humility on the Lord, and we're all pride. You know, we've really got to be careful with pride. When a person ministers on, all, on an altar call in, and he's ministering in pride, another spirit flows. You say that again. If a person is ministering to someone on this other call and they have a heart of pride in it, they switch into another spirit. The eyes of the Lord run to and fro. These anointings run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in those whose heart is perfect towards him. That's why I've seen people ministering on another call with, with, with kind of pride and they switch out of the Holy Spirit into a spirit of power which is not the Holy Spirit. And there's persons, I've seen people go... But it wasn't the Holy Spirit that came out of the heart condition of the person who was ministering, switched realms. These anointings, the eyes of the Lord, come to those whose heart is perfect towards him. And the key is humility. Pride is the thing that God resists more than anything. See, and it's a hard attitude. We have to be careful. A hard attitude. You know, when I first began to preach this, I really got crucified. I tell you, people say I was in the occult, I was into this, I was in the other, I was... You better believe it. I, I, I wondered what I had said, you know. It, 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 was, it, was, um, it was unbelievable. And I thought, Lord, what are you doing to me? I know I'm right, but what are you doing to me? You know, and I kind of pulled out of that whole realm. Because the, the criticism was so strong. And then I read an interesting story about a revival. And, uh, and I knew this man. I've met this man in, in, in China and he, he, in previously Formosa. And um, they again, he, he ministered in an orphanage at this time on the mainland China. It was very, very interesting. His name is Baker. He just died recently. And um, he, he, he ministered there. And they had an outpouring of the Holy Spirit in that orphanage. Isn't it funny how it often comes in orphanages or among children? Interesting. And uh, he said, I'm just quoting from his book, Visions Beyond the Veil. And he said, um, the Holy Spirit came with seven lamps. So when I saw that, I thought, praise God, I've seen this. I know what this is about. He said, at a time of special outpouring of the Holy Spirit, these seven lamps of fire were seen to be let down from heaven into the room in our very midst. And at other times in these visions of the throne of, of Christ in heaven, children saw the seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of the Lord. We all knew that the seven lamps meant the anointing was in our midst. I had never read that anywhere before. Nobody had spoken to me. And suddenly, 
in this great revival and outpouring of the Holy Spirit, they, they began to understand this. In the first days of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, one small boy spoke in pure prophecy. When the Spirit he seemed, when in the Spirit he seemed to be in heaven at the feet of Jesus, the Lord spoke through him in the first person, clearing up many things the children did not understand and telling them how to seek the Lord and what to do. And uh, at that time the Lord said, when the Spirit is moving in your midst, don't open your eyes because you'll be distracted and it will hinder you. He said, but the Holy Spirit will descend to give you power. These seven anointings. To preach the gospel, to cast out demons, to heal the sick. The Holy Spirit is in seven colors. Those are the colors of the rainbow. Boy, one of the rainbow. One of the older boys then said, when the Spirit had been upon him, he had seen a great red light and other colors when they were preaching. You see, they were prophetically preaching. And, um, and so it goes on, the word of the Lord explained this to him and others who had seen different colors. Of course, I know light is made up of seven colors, but well, we know that, seven visible colors anyway. But I had never thought of the seven lamps before the throne of God as being seven anointings. All light comes from God, but God is light. And it goes on describing this. If you can get hold of that book, it's very interesting, Ephesians Beyond the Veil. I think it's out of print, but if you can get hold of it, it's interesting. The anointing, we've got to close angelic carriers when they come the atmosphere changes when we cooperate with them the power of God flows now it's really important that we be trying to grasp this you know William Branham ministered through an angel that stood at his side all through his ministry now he went off the rails at the end but he was a great man of God great man of God and um, Smith Wigglesworth when healing Whenever Smith Wigglesworth was moving powerfully in healing, he testifies and others in the congregation that an angel stood at his side to minister with him. A spirit of healing. And, and so we could go on. Jesus, closing with this, worked with angels all the time. Remember, in, 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 in Matthew 4.11 it says the devil left him and the angels came and ministered to Jesus. Gave him strength. You need to ask for that. You see, he ministered and gave him strength. That's after an intense time of spiritual warfare. These angels came and ministered to him. And finally, in, first, in John chapter 1, 51, Jesus said unto him, said to Nathaniel, you know, he just operated a word of knowledge to say, you know, about Nathaniel. Nathaniel was astounded. He said unto him, very then say unto you, hereafter you will see the heavens opened and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. He told about his ministry. He was now coming into his ministry and he said, this is a very significant scripture because Jesus is saying that he would continually work with those angels ascending and descending upon him. That's what he was saying. Saying, hereafter Jesus said it, you will see the heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. And the context was Nathaniel was astounded at the insight that Jesus had into his life. The inference being that he's going to see greater things through the anointing because of the angels of God ascending and descending upon him. See, Jesus worked with angels continuously, according to the scriptures. Now, the Bible says that we have not because we ask not. We have not because we ask not. And that includes every area of life, the anointing, every area of life. We have not because we ask not. He longs for us to act, ask. There is a spiritual principle that many things we don't get unless we ask for them. Because that's how it works. You have to ask. And I believe that if you believe, you know, and, and believing with faith releases this realm of operation into our lives. There's a lot more I could say where time has gone by. I've crammed four messages into one this afternoon. But, you know, this whole area is so important in the days that lie ahead. To make right decisions, at times you're going to need angelic visitation. In the months and the years that lie ahead, how many of you know it is very, 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 very important where you live in the last days? And it can, it can be met, the difference between your, losing your life or saving your life where you physically live. Very important. We need to hear from God in these end times. Some whole nations are going to be wiped out virtually in the end times. You know? And uh, it's really important. Just before Sodom and Gomorrah were wiped out, what happened? An angel came. To, Come on, boys. Time to go. Really important. I believe 
Perth in the southwest is a city of refuge in the end times. I really do believe that. But before we relocate to any other place in it, we better hear from God. Because the time is short. And we better need to know that we're hearing from God. See, they visited Lot. You see, you've got to move you out of here. They hadn't, you know, Lot's wife is a problem. Because her heart was hooked into all of the things of Sodom. Saying she was turned into a pillar of salt. Judgment came on that city. Angelic visitation. The anointing. Messengers of God. Let's pray. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Lord, I just pray that truth will prevail. That revelation by your Spirit shall change our lives, change the way we minister. I pray, Lord, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. I pray, Lord, that you will just confirm your word today in the name of Jesus. Just, just want to wait before we close the service out, just to just, just see just in what way the Lord wants to do this before we go home. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Mm. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Seven spirits of the Lord help you. Hallelujah. 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 There are angels and, and their whole role is music and worship and teach you a lot of things. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you. Thank you. I really believe that, uh, I believe the, the Lord, if uh, your heart is open, just before we go today, that uh, the Lord wants to assign an angel or angels, but angel to be with you and, and to help you in what he is purposing for you. What is happening in your life at this present time? With some of you, it might be ministry, and it might be anointing for various things. But I kind of feel um, that that when I was driving in today, um, I felt the Holy Spirit speak to me and say, "I want you to play that te- that that song at the beginning of the service. I will be with you." And I didn't even know where I could even put my hands on that, find that. Um, but I, I did. The Lord led me straight to it, and I found it in the cupboard. You know, and I, and, I, and I felt the Lord was emphasizing something that he wants to be with us and we know that the Lord is with us and we've been talking about walking with Jesus in the spirit but you see when we walk with Jesus everything that is around him is available to us and the angelic realm was, a, it was an integral part of the life and ministry of Jesus and he wants to be with us personally personal relationship with Jesus and with the Holy Spirit. He also wants to be with us through the angelic realm. It says that the, the, the angels of the Lord will encamp around those who fear him. He wants that to be in our lives. And I just kind of believe today that God wants to confirm his word and just just release to you. you see, it requires faith and you've got to be open and receptive. But I believe as I pray in a minute, it will be released. And those of you whose hearts are open to him for that, that you will have an angelic uh, messenger from the realm of God's spirit released to you, or at least for some considerable time, to be able to assist you. Now it will be varying in different people's lives. But you'll become sensitive to, to, to a... A particular thing happening in your life, you become sensitive to an anointing which you will be able to link to this time when we're going to pray. And uh, I just kind of believe that this is how God wants to confirm His word today. I believe it's very, very real. We're not just talking kind of airy, fairy things here. It is 
it is very, very real. In fact, I'm aware of angels right now. Very, very real. Very, very real. And they're very eager to assist. They're very eager to help. Let's just reach out to the Lord. We're just going to pray simply before we go. But I'm going to believe for an impartation now. You know, we could pray for the sick. We could do anything. But this is what God wants to do. And we have to do what we see Him doing. Hallelujah. Just, just begin to raise the Lord. To open their hearts in faith. Prophetic anointings that are angelic. Lord, all kinds of things in the realm of the Spirit. Let it be assigned. Let there be an assignment. Father, in the name of Jesus, let it be released. In Jesus' name. Today, let it be released. 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 Today. In the name of Jesus. Let there be an impartation right across this auditorium today, Father, in the name of Jesus. Let those angels be released to your people, Lord. Let them be assigned. Let them begin to give them insight and understanding and revelation and anointing and protection. Father, in the name of Jesus, let it happen. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. By the power of the Holy Spirit, through the will of God, let it be released into their lives today. Let there be angels assigned. That's it. In the name of Jesus. In the name of many, many, many angels now. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. As we just listen to this song, just keep your hands up. I will be with you. You'll find that, that there'll, there'll be an angel, maybe more than one, who will take its place with you today. Be assigned to you.